That summer wasn't the first to see the crop fail. Fields blighted, hungry mouths left unfed. Your grandfather spoke of such things many times during your youth. Of never-ending winters and waterless summers. The wrath of the gods, untethered. But like the rest of the villagers, you hadn't given it much heed. An old man with an overactive imagination. Game had been plentiful back in those days. Rivers full of jumping fish. The woodland spirits generous in their offerings. And like the other youths of the valley, you'd spent much of that time hunting, fighting for sport, and building a name for yourself as a reliable warrior. Born into a family of worth, in truth, you didn't hold much regard for the talk of farmers, indulging in the life given to you of happiness and mirth. Yet, you should have listened to your elder. By the time the strangers arrived, it was already too late. Galloping in on their long-maned steeds, Harsh war cries stabbing through the valley. Cut marks on their cheeks. Wild eyes in their grim skulls. The gods were angry. And only after the Outlanders made off with nearly all of the clan's cattle did you realize just how much their anger could let loose on your people. It was a blur after that. As befitted a man of his position, your father took it upon himself to appease the spirits. Personally heading down to the underworld to beseech them himself. You would have begged him not to, but knew it would just displease the gods further. That most ultimate of sacrifices was an honourable one the most honourable anyone could give. And for a time, it had worked, a kind of relief washing over the clan. The next harvest bore enough to feed every hungry mouth in the village. Things were looking up. But then, next spring, they came again. And this time, they found few heads of cattle to appease their harsh rulers. Yet, fortune smiled on you that day. You'd been out hunting in the forest. You saw the smoke and the flames long before you reached the outskirts of the village. Hearing the distant screams too. Of course, by this point, you knew it in your gut. It was already too late. All you could do was watch from the undergrowth as the proud people of the valley were led away one by one in fetters and chains. The elders were killed, of course, and many of the men, as was the want of a landless warrior band. Some of your brothers put up a fight even taking one or two of the outsiders down to the underworld with them. But most of the villagers were too weary to fight. You could see it in their eyes. They put down their arms, entering a life of servitude. Destined to tend the animals of the harsh men from the south. At least they'd be able to eat, you hoped. And that was that. By morning's first light, it was all over.
Heading south, you followed as long as you could. Everything and everyone you'd ever known. And finally, at the edge of hill country, rolling plains opening up before, you said your goodbyes. Now, it was your turn to take up the life of the outcast. Best you could hope for was to seek out a new leader, to pledge your service and regain your honour. You shouldn't have felt sorrow, but you did, despite the anger it gave to the gods. After all, you'd been spared. Turning your sorrow to rage, you continued on. Resolving yourself, you would see the world of these newcomers with your own eyes. For months you moved, living off the land as you went. Hunting by moonlight, travelling in the darkness, as one with the forest. A drifting shade, fearless and feared. Losing all track of time and space. And then finally, one day, you spied distant smoke floating upwards on the horizon. As you approached that night, fire glimmered in the heavens, like the magnificent solar disks you'd seen as a child at a great festival by the sea in the lands closer to the sun. Here, far away from that land, the ground rises up so much to be impossibly high. And that morning, you saw the greatest sight you'd ever seen. Vast ramparts lined by wooden stakes. More warriors than you'd ever seen in your life. Hundreds of them, and even more within. And so many people to be impossible to count. Animals too, all come together here of all places. Yes. Here would be a lord worthy of your service. Of course, you've seen many great constructions in the decades since, all over the land. But you never forgot the first time you laid eyes on one. You strode forwards, making yourself known. Nearly 2,800 years have passed since that day. That was a thought experiment, an idea based on the latest archaeological evidence from Britain's early Iron Age, when a new world came into conflict with the old. And that great fortress, its ramparts long having faded away in the centuries since, its people gone, its real name lost. Its bones remain, as they likely will for another 2,800 years to come. Today, we know it as Penny Krieg, and this is its story. When I came to Penny Creek in the summer of 2021, I was blown away by the sheer scale of the place. We saw many hill forts on that trip, and castles, and Roman forts too, but Penny Creek was the highlight.
looking out from the summit, flanked by horses standing guard. The imposing mountain of Penny Fan looms. As it does everywhere you look in this area. The Brecon beacons stretch off on the one side, and on the other, the Black Mountains loom. On a clear day, you can just about see all the way to the distant hills of England. Much closer, you can see several neighbouring hill forts. One, Code Fenny Fach, sitting on the next wooded hill, is another monster. Though it's on private land, so impossible for us to access, despite our best attempts. And tens of others are scattered around. On the far side of the valley, Tawin Gare and Minith Iltuth stand in clear view. At over 300 metres above sea level, it's a naturally imposing location. But not too high up to be unpleasant. It's very mild in fact, at least when we were there. Seeming to be sheltered on most sides, with very little wind. It's no surprise to me that when this place was in its prime some 2,500 years ago, Archaeology suggests it to have been an especially important location. Home to warriors, chieftains and citizens for hundreds upon hundreds of years. The rocks here are incredibly old. Formed of red sandstone during the Devonian period, close to 400 million years ago. The age of the very first fish and trees. And during the last ice age, a mere 12,000 years ago, the hill probably jutted out of the glaciers, which tore their slow paths along these valleys. Though little remains above ground today of the settlement which once filled the interior. Penny Creek, the Welsh name simply meaning top of the mound, would have been a very busy place in its prime. Filled with the sights and sounds of people working, farming and trading. Archaeologists have found evidence here of roundhouses, stock pens, granaries, and of course, impressive earthen ramparts and stone walls. Yes, the evidence seems to suggest this place was guarded by a great bastion of masonry, a rarity in this part of the world. and testament to its immense importance to the people who lived here. For anyone coming into the fort in those ancient days, only one entrance could be found. Standing on the southeastern edge, likely flanked by well-guarded towers and blooded warriors. It was a site that would have greeted many an early Iron Age traveller. Like ours from the start of the video. For he lived during the age when these constructions first came into being. Around 800 BC or so, on the cusp of the Bronze and Iron Ages. According to recent research, a time of environmental degradation and of great societal change on the island. When people increasingly looked to fortified sites for protection. 
And interestingly, as at many locations, there is evidence of this place being occupied before it was a fort. And it was also a site that may have greeted a much later group of people. Penny Krieg seeming to have survived all the way up until the Roman conquest in the first century AD. And it is a site that has mostly survived to the present. On the north and east sides, the most impressive and complex, an astonishing five lines of defence stretch out. And those at the north or rear of the fort are among the most impressive and tallest. Only on the southeast, flanking the main gateway, do the defences seem to have been damaged over the years. Perhaps by medieval ploughing. To the east of the main gate, the fifth rampart simply fades away. And to the west of the main gate, they also lose their form. For here was a 19th century quarry, which also affected all of the other sides. A number of disused sandstone quarries still adorn the upper slopes. Victorian brickworks and tile factories too, along with a complex of clay pits, kilns and trackways from the 18th century. A place of industry then, as it was during the time of its Celtic builders all those generations ago. Unfortunately, other parts have been eroded away by people walking along the paths and ramparts. Today, they lie coated in patches of gorse, bracken and grass. And the ploughed interior is still used for grazing land. Thankfully, the place is on common land today, owned and managed by the Brecon Beacon Park Authority. Who knows how many more societal collapses and ice ages the place will survive? <laughs>